the historic setting. To create the setting, Joseph, Jacob's son, had just been sold by his brothers. Moreover, the brothers had lied to Jacob. Jacob had to come to terms with the fact that his son, Joseph, had died. To his brothers, he was gone for good, possibly even dead. However, Joseph was very much alive. When Joseph was taken to Egypt by the Ishmaelite traders, he was purchased by Potiphar, an Egyptian officer. Potiphar was captain of the guard for Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. Genesis 39 verse 1 Joseph found himself in a foreign place and culture, surrounded by a new language. This once desired child of Rachel, an openly favored son of Jacob, had been sold as a common slave and pushed into a predicament that appeared to be even worse than the abyss into which his siblings had thrown him. Two things are obvious by their scarcity as we are introduced to his situation in Egypt. First and foremost, there is no reference of time. We have no idea how long Joseph had been at Potiphar's house before these events occur. He may have spent two years or two months there. Second, no mention is made of the changes that Joseph had to make. Remember, he came from a home where he was the pride and joy of his mother and the favorite child of a doting, aged father. He was grabbed roughly by his brothers, stripped of his gorgeous robe, and hurled into a deep, unclean pit without warning. He was rescued from that scenario, only to be sold to hardened slave traders and transported overland by caravan to a distant land, where he was thrown on the block and sold like a cheap item of merchandise. He must have gone through a lot of adjustments and changes. According to Genesis, he was sold to a man named Potiphar, who was described as the captain of the bodyguard or, as the NIV interprets it, captain of the guard. Potiphar was no idiot, no matter what title you gave him. He was a man of seasoned military experience, with power over life and death. Joseph, on the other hand, not only adjusted to his new position, but thrived in it, for one significant reason. That reason emerges in a beautiful phrase that appears a number of times in Joseph's story. And the Lord was with Joseph. The Lord was with Joseph, so that he prospered, and he lived in the house of his Egyptian master. When his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord gave him success in everything he did, Joseph found favor in his eyes and became his attendant. Potiphar put him in charge of his household and he entrusted to his care everything he owned. From the time he put him in charge of his household and of all that he owned, the Lord blessed the household of the Egyptian because of Joseph. The blessing of the Lord was on everything Potiphar had, both in the house and in the field. So Potiphar left everything he had in Joseph's care. With Joseph in charge, he did not concern himself with anything except the food he ate. Now Joseph was well-built and handsome. Genesis 39 verses 2 through 6 Joseph's life was intricately intertwined with the sovereign God of Israel. He directed him. He favored him in Potiphar's eyes. God, without a doubt, was the key to Joseph's success. It has nothing to do with luck. Furthermore, Joseph did not need to convince Potiphar that the Lord was with him because Potiphar could see it for himself. When his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord gave him success in everything he did. Genesis 39 verse 3. Furthermore, Joseph did not utilize his religiosity as a ruse to gain favor from his boss. Joseph earned favor in the Lord's eyes simply because the Lord made all he did prosper. Notice it doesn't say that Joseph asked favors from Potiphar he found favor with Potiphar. Potiphar recognized Joseph's confidence in Jehovah because he saw the evidence of that faith in Joseph's life and labor, a winning combination. Joseph was a hardworking, diligent young guy. Potiphar increased his responsibilities and authority as a result. Eventually, the captain of the guard assigned him responsibility for his own household. In other words, he transferred all his possessions to Joseph's control. All that came to him, he put in his charge, the Hebrew says. Interesting, not only did Potiphar's possessions end up under Joseph's watchful eye and guiding hand, but so did all his benefits. What a great advancement. From a regular slave, most likely one of dozens in Potiphar's household, to running the household of Egypt's top military man. But it gets even better. For through Joseph, the Lord blessed Potiphar's house and all that he owned. Greater success brings greater levels of trust, which, in turn, leads to more periods of unguarded vulnerability. In regard to the latter, F.B. Meyer argues wisely, we may expect temptation in days of prosperity and ease rather than in days of privation and toil. 
not on the sands of the hot desert, but on the sunny plains of Campania, not when the youth is arduously climbing the steep ladder of fame, but when he has entered the golden portals, not where men frown, but where they smile sweet exquisite smiles of flattery. It is there, it is there, that the temptress lies in wait. Beware. What a wise proverb. This warning is not of concern to the person who is down and out. This message is intended for the successful, the aspiring executive, the man or woman on their way to the top of the heap, the one who is receiving the benefits of enhanced privacy and trust. The Scottish essayist Thomas Carlyle was correct when he remarked, Adversity is sometimes hard upon a man, but for one man who can stand prosperity, there are a hundred that will stand adversity. The temptations that accompany prosperity are far greater and far more subtle than those that accompany adversity. Joseph was clearly doing well. Potiphar was in command of everything, and we read, he, Potiphar, did not concern himself with anything except the food which he ate. That's what I'm talking about when I say trust. Here was a slave who deserved to be revered and trusted. As a result, Potiphar handed over everything to him. I interpret this to suggest that Joseph planned his own schedule, organized Potiphar's estate, and managed all his finances. Potiphar entrusted everything to Joseph. But keep in mind that with greater success comes greater levels of trust, which inevitably leads to greater periods of vulnerability. At such times, we may expect temptation in prosperous days. It is there that the temptation lies in wait. Beware! The Holy Spirit, who hovered over the writing of the biblical text, led to the smart and exact selection of words. As a result, Genesis 39 verse 6 concludes with an unexpected but significant sentence. Now Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. The Living Bible says, Joseph, by the way, was a very handsome young man. The New International Version reads, Joseph was well-built and handsome. These words used to describe Joseph's appearance are found only four times in the Old Testament, with Joseph, with Saul, with David, and with Absalom. Realize that there is nothing wrong with being physically fit or attractive. However, these characteristics come with their own set of temptations. Here was a man who had it all, fame and power, authority and respect. Here was a house worker who had it all, his own private rooms, access to highly confidential information, and his employer's total trust. On top of that, he was a good-looking man who, despite his lack of desire in doing so, attracted the attention of women. Not surprisingly, the tempter, the enemy of Joseph's soul, focused on those outward features. The scriptures don't mince words. Neither did Potiphar's wife. And it was after these happenings that his master's wife looked at Joseph with desire and said, Lie with me. Genesis 39 verse 7. That's what I would call the direct approach. Let's return to an earlier comment. Greater achievements lead to more vulnerable moments. The temptress is waiting for you there. Beware. And it came about after these events. The author of Genesis says, alluding to the earlier verses detailing Joseph's achievement, because Joseph was primed for the enemy's strike, it was delivered with laser-like precision. Potiphar's wife was brash and shameless in her approach. Come to bed with me. Most people, both then and now, would have been taken aback and, at the least, felt flattered by such a tempting statement. Joseph, on the other hand, not even for a second, he reacted with equal bravery, without hesitancy, and completely confident in himself and his God. But he refused, telling his master's wife. But he refused, and said unto his master's wife, Behold, my master woteth not what is with me in the house, and he hath committed all that he hath to my hand. There is none greater in this house than I, neither hath he kept back anything from me but thee, because thou art his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Genesis 39, verse 8 through 9. Verse 8 simply states, He refused. Joseph flatly refused. Don't forget those two great words even if you forget everything else. If you're sitting there thinking that Joseph was some kind of spiritual giant, forget it. If you think a mystical veil of protection kept him in control, think again. Take a look at the proof. An Egyptian woman offered her body and a young Jewish servant was enticed by her brazen overtures. So he refused. No, he said. He fought her seductive remarks, staring her down, 
determined not to submit. How could he do such a thing? For two reasons. First, his devotion to his master. My master, trust me, he said to this woman. He has delegated authority over all he owns to me. You, his wife, are the only thing that isn't mine. I'd never betray his faith. The second motivation was his devotion to God. How could I do this great evil and sin against God? Clarence Edward McCartney adds a realistic touch. This was no ordinary temptation. Joseph was a red-blooded young man, not a stone or a mummy in his 20s. It wasn't just one temptation on one day, but a series of them. How could this red-blooded young man in his late 20s say no? Because he was aware that his life was an open book in front of his God. By this point in his life, Joseph's God was more real to him than anything or anyone else on the planet. He was in a secret chamber, absolutely safe with the master's wife, who had set up this anticipated moment of lusty delight for him. He was a dashing young bachelor. They were by themselves, yielding would have been the most natural thing in the world. But according to Joseph, this is a grave evil, a horrific offense against his God. As a result, he walked away. You might be thinking, phew, boy, I'm glad that's over with. I am grateful to God for Joseph's example. You forcefully fight temptation like that, and it is banished from your life for good. You wish. And it came to pass, as she spoke to Joseph day by day, that he hearkened not unto her, to lie by her, or to be with her. Genesis 39 verse 10. Potiphar's wife would not take no for an answer. She wasn't about to be ignored. So she pressured Joseph day after day after day. This was a devilish seductress. She was compelled to have sex with Joseph. All of his discourse about the moral reasons for resisting just fueled her determination. She was unconcerned about the purity of her marriage or the trust between her husband and this young man. She was only concerned with satisfying her physical desires right now. If you're living in the delusory belief that if you resist temptation, it will go away, break it right now. In reality, when you think like this, you become an even more attractive target for the tempter. Furthermore, keep in mind that the tempter desires the recognized personality, the one who is quoted by others, the successful individual, the trusted spouse, and the godly soul. That's why it's not unexpected that Potiphar's wife pursued Joseph with such tenacity. He was a hoot, get him, and she'd accomplish something. But Joseph refused to budge. And aren't we glad? The tiniest show of interest in her would have sealed his fate. Bonhoeffer's words are worth repeating. In our members, there is a slumbering inclination towards desire, which is both sudden and fierce. With irresistible power, desire seizes mastery over the flesh. All at once a secret, smoldering fire is kindled. The lust thus aroused envelops the mind and will of man in deepest darkness. The powers of clear discrimination and of decision are taken from us. Once the embers of lust begin to smolder, the vivid scene portrayed in James 1 goes into action. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. James 1 verses 13 through 14. The allure of sexual lust acts like a magnet, drawing two sudden and fierce forces toward each other inner desire, and an outward bait. Let's face it, if you live in the real world, you can't escape the bait. In fact, even if you manage to isolate yourself from the outside world, your mind will not allow you to escape the outer bait. However, keep in mind that there is no sin in the bait. The sin is in the bite. You have been lured when the lust of another tempts you to give in to your own lust, so much so that your resistance weakens. You've succumbed to the allure of temptation. Joseph exemplifies this secret beautifully. He refused to surrender. He persisted in his resistance. Potiphar's wife kept dropping the bait day after day after day. In each time, Joseph refused to accept it. No, 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 he exclaimed. He not only did not listen to her, but he also did not want to be near her. She was not a person to be around. Joseph had repeatedly refused her attempts, refusing to surrender to them. Finally, she planned a trap for him. And it came to pass about this time that Joseph went into the house to do his business, and there was none of the men of the house there within. And she caught him by his garment, saying, Lie with me. And he left his garment in her hand, and fled, and got him out. 
Genesis 39, verse 11 through 12. One day, Joseph came into the house to conduct his duties. There were no servants in sight. Why is this so? Potiphar's wife may have dispatched them on errands to get them out of the way. Whatever the reason, she was alone in the house with Joseph, and she made another move. Only this time, she was not going to take no for an answer. She went beyond verbal advances and physically seized Joseph's hand. She clung so firmly to him that he yanked away and rushed out into the street. He left his outer robe in her clutches. What a clear picture. What a practical way to shine a light on truth from Joseph's life. What good biblical advice. When the New Testament dwells on sensual temptation, it gives us one command. Run. We are not instructed in the Bible to reason with it. It does not instruct us to consider it and claim verses. It instructs us to flee. You can't give in to sensuality if you're running from it. So, flee for your life. Get yourself out of there. You will eventually yield if you try to reason with lust or toy with sensual fantasies. You're not going to be able to fight it. That is why we run. And that is just what Joseph did. He dashed out into the street, leaving Potiphar's wife standing there, rejected yet again, clutching his garment. She was furious. Heaven has no rage like love to hatred turned, nor hell a fury like a woman scorned, William Congreve famously said. Mrs. Potiphar's passion was transformed into rage. She had lusted for him, but now detested him, which resulted in a fabricated attack complaint. When she noticed that he had left his garment in her hand and had fled outside, she summoned the men of her household and told them. When she saw that he had left his cloak in her hand and had run out of the house, she called her household servants. Look, she said to them, this Hebrew has been brought to us to make sport of us. He came in here to sleep with me, but I screamed. Genesis 39, verse 13 through 14. This scorned woman now desired only vengeance. To accomplish this, she constructed a bogus case against Joseph based on circumstantial evidence, his robe, and she laid up his garment by her until his Lord came home. And she spoke unto him according to these words, saying, The Hebrew servant, which thou hast brought unto us, came in unto me to mock me. And it came to pass, as I lifted up my voice and cried, that he left his garment with me and fled out. And it came to pass, when his master heard the words of his wife, which she spoke unto him, saying, After this manner did thy servant to me, that his wrath was kindled. And Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison, a place where the king's prisoners were bound, and he was there in the prison. Genesis 39, verses 16 through 20. She lied to the members of the household, saying, Look at what he's done. And here's the proof. It was his robe. When he attacked me, I grabbed it. Her screams and tears were those of a rejected woman, outraged that gorgeous young Joseph had resisted her advances, that he didn't want anything to do with her. When we read this biblical tale, our hearts can't help but go to Joseph. If there's ever a time to reward this man Joseph, it would be now. Reward him for saying no day after day after day. Reward him for running instead of yielding. Watch closely as the plot against Joseph unfolds. On the surface, it is heartbreaking. The Personal Ramifications Joseph was completely innocent, but the odds were stacked against him. Potiphar's wife had his robe as evidence, as well as her position in the family as a source of manipulative influence. She used both against him, resulting in his imprisonment. Joseph was still imprisoned. Consider what was going through Joseph's mind at this point, just after he was imprisoned. He was not only innocent, but he had repeatedly rejected obvious temptation. He never read Genesis 41 before. He had no idea what would happen in the end. He didn't know that in a matter of years, he would be prime minister of Egypt. All the man knew at this painful moment was that he had done what was right and had suffered wrong for it. Time dragged by. Days turned into months. He was, again, unfairly rejected, forgotten, totally helpless. But somehow, in the midst of this unfair situation, Joseph sensed that Jehovah's hand was in all this. Joseph, you're mine. Just wait. I'm with you. I'm not ignoring you or rejecting you. You will be a better man, Joseph, because of this accusation against you. I'm not through preparing you for my service. Does that sound too pious? Are those meanderings too much for you to swallow? Am I off base here? Not if we believe the rest of the story recorded in this chapter. 
But the Lord was with Joseph, and showed him mercy, and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners that were in the prison, and whatsoever they did there, he was the doer of it. The keeper of the prison looked not at anything that was under his hand, because the Lord was with him, and that which he did, the Lord made it to prosper. Genesis 39, verses 21 through 23. Have you noticed the important phrase, the Lord was with him? Joseph was in the hands of the Lord. However, the relationship was mutual. Joseph, too, obeyed God. Instead of being bitter and angry, he put God first. As a result, he thrived, even while imprisoned. Amazing. A few practical words of hope. It's possible that you're currently confronted with temptation. Maybe you've already yielded. Some may be thinking to themselves, so far, I've been able to resist the allure of sensual temptation, but I need your support to keep going. But no one watching this can say, I have no idea what you're talking about. I've never seen anything like it in my entire life. As a result, let me conclude with some practical advice. By the grace of God, four conditions must be met if you intend to avoid temptation. I'll cut to the chase and then explain out each one. Number one, you must not be weakened by your situation. Number two, you must not be deceived by the persuasion. Number three, you must not be gentle with your emotions. Number four, you must not be confused with the immediate results. When it came to his predicament, Joseph had it all figured out. He was financially secure. He was respected and trusted in his profession. He could have let all this weaken his resolve, allowing himself to succumb to the chance presented to him, but he did not. I'll say it again. If you're going to fight temptation, you can't be weakened by your circumstances. This is consistent with the second condition that you must adhere to. You must not be duped by persuasion. Your temptress or tempter will use precisely the perfect words to persuade you. My husband does not meet my requirements as well as you. By doing so, you will demonstrate that you genuinely care about me. Will anyone ever discover us out? We're utterly alone and completely safe. We both need to be aware of the times we live in. Moral and ethical self-control is the most valuable characteristic you can give to your spouse and family. Maintain your composure, my friend. Refuse to give in. You too can do what Joseph did. You too must. Every day, deceptive baits are placed around us, and they do not all come from individuals. Some of them are influenced by a cable television channel, the internet, a magazine, peer pressure at school, or coworkers. Mrs. Potiphar's enticing remarks will play over and over in your head. You'll feel like a prude, the only one who isn't giving in. Don't be fooled by persuasion. No matter how lovely and attractive the words may sound, it's a sham. Remember that it's all a lie. Third, let me emphasize this principle. You must not be gentle with your emotions. That's right, you read that accurately. Your inner feelings will beg you to be satisfied. Temptation will work on them, pleading for forgiveness. Remember how tenacious Joseph was with his? Finally, you must not be dazzled by the instant outcomes. Remember Joseph once more. He was wrongly accused and imprisoned after doing what was right and battling evil. You'll discover that he was later forgotten for an extended period of time. Don't be misled by the quick outcomes. You could lose your job. You could lose your lover, if you want to call that person a lover. You may lose the group's acceptance. You may be mocked. You might be kicked out of the club. You could be the only one who isn't doing it. Then you must be the only one. If you name Jesus Christ's name, name it totally and completely and keep yourself morally clean from this day forward. Even if it means being demoted, losing one's status, or losing one's job. Get the hell out. You owe it to yourself and your family. Most importantly, you owe it to God. The reality revealed in Joseph's life applies to all of us, whether we are married or unmarried, divorced or remarried, man or woman, young or elderly. Don't linger in any circumstance, no matter how enticing, delicious, or briefly delightful the bait appears. Claim the miraculous strength that comes from knowing Jesus Christ and stand strong in his might as you operate under his authority. Decide to be a Joseph right now, in this exact now. Make up your mind to join his ranks and then refuse from now on. You will yield if you do not. It's only a matter of time before it happens. God always protects his own people. 
To watch the story of David and Goliath, click here.